We're going to now proceed with the second part of the candidates forum for tonight. And if, in case some of you have walked in later, I'm going to repeat the... Could I ask people to stop, stop the conversation? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. The mayoral candidates are going to be presented in alphabetical order. Each candidate will have five minutes to make an initial introductory presentation. If you have a question for one candidate or all the candidates, raise your hand and a volunteer will come around and bring you a pencil and an index card. When your question is ready, hold it in the air and the volunteer will, will come and collect it. Um, the questions that the mayoral candidates have been asked to address in their opening remarks, in your opinion, what are the two most important issues the newly elected mayor should address while in office? And what ideas do you have to address these issues? In alphabetical order, Pam Kanine will be first. First of all, thank you to the McKee Association for sponsoring tonight's event. Thank you for you, your audience participation by attending. And I also want to thank the folks at home who are watching on the video. My active campaign for mayor began approximately a year ago following our last national election. I took heart in the words of President Obama Obama who said, if you are disappointed by your elected officials, grab a clipboard, get some signatures, and run for office yourself. Show up, dive in, and stay at it. And while I, I was not disappointed in our local officials, I decided it was time to have a second female mayor of Yellow Springs. Uh, specifically, the first and only being Jean Barlow Hudson, who was mayor from 1987 to 1991 here in the village. Now, a bit of history here. In a 1991 Yellow Springs news commentary, Jean wrote, quote, mayoral candidates, in my opinion, should believe in keeping the vitality and independence of Yellow Springs. This is a town so independent that it has insisted on its own school system, its own medication system, its own electrical distribution system, and has established its own land trust. It manifests its uniqueness in many other ways, and I believe it must continue to support its own local court." End quote. Which brings me to our first question for tonight. In your opinion, what are the two most important issues the mayor needs to address? And to me, that would be the two duties the mayor is charged with overseeing and administering. Number one, the mayor's court. Number two, the ceremonial duties of the office. And this is according to Article 3, Sections 28 and 29 of our village charter. So, I'm running right on to question two. What ideas do I have to address these issues? Number one, for mayor's court. I will listen to the community and I will follow the recommendations of the Village Justice System Task Force as they are approved by Council, which recommends expanded use of Mayor's Court for violations that are allowed in Mayor's Court. Chief Carlson and his officers are already following this recommendation. Cases have increased already in calendar year 2017. Number two. I will increase the use of restorative justice approaches and techniques in the court, and I'm looking forward to participating in the upcoming restorative justice workshop at Antioch College later this month. Number three, I will be committed to maintaining local justice for local issues through the continued support of our mayor's court. Now, Let's look at the other charge for the mayor. That would be the ceremonial aspects. Ribbon cuttings, parades, proclamations, weddings, um, 
supporting local initiatives such as our recent Yellow Springs Dementia Friendly Village initiative. Representing our village would be such an honor and frankly I believe it would be a lot of fun. I will visit our classrooms K-12 and the Antioch School as part of my third aspect of the mayor's position which I would like to expand. I will visit our classrooms to discuss local government, how it works, what does a mayor do, what does the village manager do, what does the council do, what's the difference between those, and so forth. I will also work with students on how they can increase their agency and have their voices heard, should they choose it, within the school system. As a reading specialist, I've envisioned a Read with the Mayor program going into our schools and our library. I've already talked with several teachers and administrators who are on board with this project, and I'm really excited about it. So what do we have, should I be elected? We have Mayor's Court, we have the ceremonial aspects, and we have the educational issues. Those are the three issues I'll be supporting if elected. To me, Yellow Springs is a wonderfully dynamic, diverse, and socially responsible and responsive village. I do believe it's unique and I want to nourish this. <laughs> Our next presenter will be Laura Curlis. Thank you very much. My name is Laura Curlis and I'm running for mayor. When I was a prosecutor, I used to ask juries one question. Do you believe that police charge somebody that they're guilty? And the reason I ask that question is because about half the people who come into a jury pool believe that if the police charged it, they must have done it. Now, that means the presumption of innocence is lost. That instead, people bring a presumption of guilt with them when they judge a case. The mayor primarily has to be a fair and impartial judge for all kinds of cases. The mayor's court hears misdemeanor cases up to an M1, which can be punishable by 180 days in jail, $1,000 fine. So you have M1, M2, M3, M4, you have minor misdemeanors, you have traffic infractions, you have a whole panoply of uh, crimes and, and misdemeanors and traffic citations that, frankly, when you go to law school, you spend a year studying. And you also spend a lot of time talking about and learning about people's rights. They have the right to pres be presumed innocent. They have a right to an attorney if it's a jailable offense. They have a right to get a public defender if they cannot afford one. And I'm so passionate about running because people are not getting that right now in our mayor's court. If you read the newspapers, even Justice Pfeiffer in the Supreme Court, he had some pretty dire things to say about mayor's courts in, in Ohio. There are only two states in the union that still do mayor's courts. And they often get called very bad names like kangaroo courts. I'm not saying ours is. But, they, but Justice Pfeiffer pointed out how many times people's rights are trampled on in mayor's courts. I want to change that. How do we change it? Well, first we need to bring the cases back from mayor's, back from Xenia. I don't know if you know this, but we are not getting Xenia, a Yellow Springs justice, we're getting Xenia justice. So in 2000, I went and pulled all the cases that are going to Xenia that in, instead of coming here to Yellow Springs. Front and back. So in 2016, that meant there were 509 cases and traffic cases, misdemeanors and traffic, that went to Xenia instead of through our mayor's court. And we pay about $60,000 a year for mayor's court. Are, are you getting value for your dollar if the cases are going to Xenia? Are you getting Yellow Springs justice if the cases are going to Xenia? I don't think so. So how do we change this? Number one, there are three ways to change it. The chief can make a policy that the police, there are employees, that the police charge everything they can into Yellow Springs court. That would be number one. 
If the chief doesn't do it, and I think he's open to that, then the village manager can make it a policy. Again, these are our employees. Number three, council can pass a resolution saying the same thing. But we have to get serious about pulling those cases back. Or if I'm elected mayor in two years, you're going to hear me advocating to get rid of mayor's court as a waste of taxpayer money. So let's use it. Number two, so they've been doing better in 2017. So, so far in 2017, and I pulled it through September, um, just, uh, just 156 of our cases have gone to mayor's court. Now, what does this mean for revenue? In 2016, it meant we lost $25,000 of revenue. And, and what it meant, and that's just looking at court costs, which is $80 in mayor's court. That's the number I used. And so in 2017, it means about 6560 so these are, so I got involved in the mayor's race. I mean, I talked to the mayor last time he ran about, I was thinking about running against him, but then I didn't because I understand how tough it is to run against incumbents. So then um, I was asked over the past year and a half, I was asked, well, will you go see this person in jail or will you go talk to this person? They've been charged or this person's down in Xenia, they need a lawyer. And I went and talked to him and I'm like, well, why is your case in Xenia. I'm like, why are you, why are we, not, that you're a Yellow Springs person, this is a Yellow Springs piece of property, Yellow Springs, Yellow Springs, why are we down there? And believe me, and I tried to get a couple of these cases transferred back. So anyway, that's why I'm running in and restorative justice. Thank you very much. We'll hear from Catherine Price. Hi, I'm Catherine Price, and I'm running for mayor. I've lived here 23 years, and I was telling somebody today that my theme song for standing up here might be, You Don't Know Me. <laughs> a lot of you don't know me. I've kind of lived a uh, reclusive life. Um, I'm, uh, I'm interested in the mayor's court as well as in the ceremonial duties of weddings and i thought another good campaign slogan might be catherine price wants to marry you so, <laughs> but the two things that we were going to be covering tonight were the issues about the mayor's court one is that we do keep the mayor's court which has been brought up and so say you were caught for speeding how many of you would want to go to court in Xenia if you had the chance to come here? Nobody, so. <laughs> and the, the mayor's court offers a friendly and personal service. It takes care of Yellow Springers in a Yellow Springs way. And I think it's really important to use it and keep it. Um, Chief Carlson is going to get a list of the uh, offenses that are able to uh, qualify to be heard here and that's kind of being reviewed because he, uh, they want to dot all their i's and cross all their t's and make sure they're doing the right thing because there are some cases that wouldn't be able to be heard here and they don't want to step outside the bounds in the past there have been uh, attempts to abolish the mayor's court in in ohio um, mayor's courts that act as atms for the village funds um, are not looked upon nicely. Um, the mayor has to remain um, a fair judge and if excessive fines are charged that go directly to the budget, that doesn't seem very fair. Um, so that's, that's one of the criticisms of the mayor's court. Um, So, because this is Yellow Springs, we need to use our courts in a Yellow Springs way, in a trend-setting way. Um, Yellow Springs has always been a geographical point, I don't know how this happened, for experimentation and innovation. And you look back 200 years, you see that there have been communities and organizations that have gotten their start here, 
that have tried to do something new, sometimes it's, sometimes it's failed, and sometimes it's taken seed out in the bigger world. And that is really our, our that's our inheritance here. That's what Yellow Springs is all about. And so the big new buzzword that we're hearing is restorative justice. Um, how can we use our courts in a way that honors the offender, and if there is a victim, the victim and the community? Um, one of those is education and information. I believe in contemplative understanding. I believe that if, if someone was cited for an offense, they could be asked to, like if it was speeding, because we see a lot of traffic here, they could be asked to write an essay about that. Where were they? Were they, were they thinking about something that happened in the past? Were they in the future? Were they angry about something? Were they seeking a thrill? If they were to be able to go back to their experience and write about that and then understand its implications and the ripple effect, even if there wasn't a victim, the risk that there could be a victim, if they were to understand that they, and respect the community as a whole, I feel like it would do a lot for that person and for the community to bring a sense of unity and belonging. Um, restorative justice says, it just means to me it's restoring the person to themselves, it's restoring, restoring them to the community, and restoring the community as a whole so that there's no broken parts. There's not somebody who did something bad over there who's going to be punished. Um, as far as the crime and punishment story, Our final, speaker this, our final speaker this evening will be uh, Gerald Sims. Hello. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the James H. McKee Association for sponsoring the candidates tonight. This is my, this will be my sixth time staying before the public uh, running for an office. The only change that I would make if I were mayor is the village needs a prosecutor. The mayor can't sit and determine what the offender is charged with and then turn around and render judgment. And I as mayor do not want to do too. So I'm going to be really beating on counsel to, uh, to hire a prosecutor. I've been a Yellow Springs resident now for almost 50 years, raising two children uh, and watching two of my grandsons grow in a village that I feel has been very safe. Uh, so much so that one of my daughters has decided to spend her life teaching here at uh, Mills Law. Now, that's a small thing that I, that I want to say. I, don't have the funds for a teleprompter, so I'm gonna I'm gonna read what I'm gonna say, and then I also left uh, copies uh, back at the table, so you know uh, people won't mis misunderstand what I'm saying and call it fake news. <laughs> <laughs> I stand before you again, offering my services to become mayor of Yellow Springs. The community has elected me and re-elected me to the school board and village council. The re-election shows that I have gained respect of the citizens and they value my judgment when I cast votes on all issues before these bodies. I've been an active member uh, in the community by volunteering for many organizations such as Girl Scouts, Youth Soccer, Yellow Springs Boosters, the Children's Center Board, I've been on the visiting pro process, Community Foundation, Human Relations Commission, and now I'm part of the 365 Project where I co-founded the Young People of Color Group. <coughs> these uh, involvement, uh, the, the, excuse me, 
just to name a few of some of the community involvement and dedication that I've done, I feel that this is a prerequisite for becoming mayor. I have been a victim of the court system as a college student, and it has stuck with me for quite a while. Now, if I'm elected mayor, I'll have the opportunity to make a difference in the lives of those that come before mayor's court. There's nothing like first-hand experience. I was put in jail at 7.30 in the morning, on a Monday morning, for not being able to pay a $25 fine. The ticket that I received did not state how much the fine would be, but it simply said, appear in court. Yeah, appear in court, I was 19 years old. A parent court says be there. You know, no one should have to go through that. Uh, and I call it humiliation at the age of 19. I want to thank you for the many successful years that I have served as a public servant. It has been my privilege to increase my responsibilities from going from the school board to fill this council, and with your help, my next step would be mayor of Will Springs. In closing, I want to state that I'm wearing paint today to show support for Cancer Awareness Month. For those who have, that have won the battle and those that continue to fight for a cure, I have a sister that has uh, had breast cancer, and I also have bad cancer in my lifetime, my lifetime, and still do. But I am positive that one day we'll find a cure. Again, I want to thank you and ask for your vote as. The first question is for Pam Kanai. Pam, you are a gifted educator. Why do you want to be mayor? And why didn't you run for school board? Fred, you might want to know how many times I've heard that question, and it's been quite a, quite a bit. After 42 years as a professional educator in this, well, most of those years in this community, a few up in Piqua, I was ready for something else. I consider myself a lifelong learner and a fearless thinker. And after spending these years in Yellow Springs, I'm ready to step up and take more of an executive slash judicial role. I wouldn't want to go through what most of the council members go through as legislators, nor the board members. I give them all the respect in the world. But what I'm interested in would be the judicial aspects and the opportunity to get back in the classroom using my professional expertise to work with the students on honing their knowledge about government and their, frankly, their reading skills. What fun. <laughs> Laura Curlis, is it correct that you were fired from your village position? And if so, why? Um, no, I left the position. Jerry Sims, if you are elected mayor and council doesn't, improve, doesn't approve the hiring of a prosecutor, how will you respond and carry out your work as mayor? It will be difficult, which basically says that I have to leave it up to the police officers to determine the charges that are written against the individual and hear that charge and make a decision. Here's a question for everyone. We're starting to build up a backlog, so I'm going to try to hold it to two responses. At the end, if there's still time, you can come back if you weren't called on. Uh, 
So the first two hands I see will get this question. What are your thoughts regarding the unused development land by Antioch University Midwest? Pam Kanai <laughs> and Jerry Sims. My answer is it doesn't matter what I think because my role would be judicial and it would be somewhat executive, not legislative. I may have my opinions and I'd be happy to share those with you later, but uh, it's not the role of the mayor according to the charter to express this sort of opinion. I shall walk the middle way. Gerald Sims, what are your thoughts regarding the unused development land by Antioch University Midwest? Use it safely. Obey the rules and regulations that are put in place. Respect the college and try not to come to my court. <laughs> this is a question for everyone. I'll uh, call on the first two hands I see. Do you know whether the changes you propose require modifications to Village Charter? Gerald Sims. Having been on the uh, Charter Review Committee, we went through the whole charter and through the uh, uh, mayor's court and so forth. Uh, it's the village, if they would like, can have a prosecutor. And that decision would be made by council. But again, as mayor elect, I hope, uh, I want a prosecutor. Um, I'm seeing, uh, Pam is the next hand I see, but there seems to be a tremendous interest for everyone to answer this, so I will just go down the line on this particular question. Do you know whether the changes you propose require modifications to Village Charter? Yes, I do know, and the answer is no. Oh, um, the changes, the things that I would like to add, I know that there are fines that, um, that have to be, uh, they have, the fines have to be a part of it. There's a range of fines for different offenses, but there, I don't think, that can't be changed. That comes down from, I think that's a state thing, but um, the kinds of things I would like to add that have to do with someone's understanding, their heartfelt understanding of what they've been through and how it affected uh, other community members and themselves. I think, I don't see why that couldn't be added in. I don't know if that would have to be chartered in. Yeah, I was on the Charter Commission too, and everything that we may want to do, any of us, to implement restorative justice techniques or we want other personnel to help, like have a public defender on site to help counsel people about their rights, or a prosecutor, council would have to um, budget for that in, in the budget, and then the mayor would implement that. Um, restorative justice, there are people, we have some great resources here, like village mediation, which can be part of a restorative justice um, technique in, in doing a restorative justice circle. With, if in the appropriate case, obviously not all cases, can you can do that. But um, most of the things we can do without changing the charter. This is a question for Gerald Sims. Do you have the stamina to serve as mayor? I'm younger than Dave. <laughs> Dave served 26 years and he survived. Uh, I think I have the stamina. They have a nice, comfortable seat in the mayor's court. That I'll be able to sit and relax. And I've been attending mayor's court sessions for the last uh, month and a half. Uh, right now they go real quick. We're only in there for about an hour. Okay. Now I'm going to be honest. If you want to get married, don't ask me to walk through the Glen uh, <laughs> December, January, and February. That's not that's not going to, that's not going to happen. We don't have to, we have to come inside. But but I think I can hear that. Mr. Sims, while you've got the mic, here's another question for you. Please say more about hiring a prosecutor. 
how much would that cost? Uh, I can only make that recommendation. The prosecutor would be hired by the village, and the village would have to determine if it's within their budget. Uh, I have to say, being, being on council, uh, we do have a solicitor's firm that works for council. And when we went out for uh, our request, when we uh, hired the last uh, uh, solicitor, three of the four uh, law firms within the proposal included the cost of a uh, prosecutor and they had folks within their office to do that. And the current solicitor, I have talked with him and he says yes, they can make that uh, an add-on to the present contract and it wouldn't break our budget. And the other thing, if uh, I heard that uh, Mayor's Court is about, it's about 60,000 a year in cost, uh, Mayor does not make 60,000. <laughs> the next question is for Laura Curlis and Gerald Sims, but I'll let Laura answer it first. You are both advocating for a prosecutor. Would that enhance the application of justice or exacerbate a difficult situation? You know, I totally get that question because when most people hear the P word, they think persecutor. Right? Right? You do, right? And prosecutors do justice. What does that mean? Good ones do. And that's why you all should have a voice in hiring a local prosecutor. But I'm going to pick on Marianne McQueen. You got charged. You got sent to Xenia. You didn't get sent to Yale Springs Mayor's Court. Guess what? Who dropped your case? A prosecutor. They finally looked at it and did what the people advocated, which is to dismiss your case. So prosecutors can keep bad cases from coming forward. They're a check on the police. They get to look at the facts and say, well, that's not a good case, or that, you know, we shouldn't even bring that. I could give you example after example of that, by the way. Um, the other thing they can do, only a prosecutor can amend charges. So if you want to bust it down from obstructing to disorderly or something like that, only a prosecutor really can bust it down. The mayor shouldn't be doing, the judge should not be doing that on the judge's own motion. What's happening now in mayor's court is the mayor is the prosecutor, the defense counsel, and is the judge. And this is why most mayor's courts that don't have a lawyer for a, for a mayor they have to hire a magistrate, and then they have a defender and a lawyer. Uh, Gerald, the question is, would, Ed, would having a prosecutor enhance the application of justice or exacerbate a difficult situation? In every system, you need a check and a balance. And the prosecutor would be that check and balance on our police department. Uh, and he or she would look at the case, look at the evidence, and determine what it should be. And, and that's, that's the way the system should work. Um, the police should not have total power, which is the way it is now in Yellow Springs, to determine what type of charges are and where they should go. We need that independent prosecutor. That prosecutor would be, would be working for us the citizens, and we need that protection. But by the way, from what I've looked at so far in the stats and so forth, folks in Yellow Springs obey the laws. And they look at what it, they say we as a community want to be. 96% of, of our speeding tickets are out of towners, and about 76% of our parking tickets are from out of towners. So that says we as Yellow Springs respect the laws, the ordinance, and so forth that we put to, uh, to live by. But we, we need that prosecutor. I, I realize that this question was not necessarily aimed only at Gerald and Laura, so I'll give Pam and Elizabeth the chance to answer it. Would having a prosecutor enhance the application of justice or exacerbate a difficult situation? I would hope it would add to the proceedings in the courtroom, but I want to be very clear that at this time I do not believe a prosecutor is necessary. Historically, we have not had prosecutors. That's 
part of what we value about our local mayor's court here in the village. I've been going to mayor's court since April. I've been watching very carefully how Mayor Fobert handles the court, his decorum with the, the, the defendants who come forward. And I'm, I'm very impressed with his methodology and how he, how he works, how he answers questions and so forth. I also realize that some of the most dangerous words in the English language are, it's always been this way. So I think we have to be very careful. I also realize we're living in a very litigious society and things might change. At that point, if we can budget the money, if we have that resource, then fine, let's consider the prosecutor as being part of the court, but not now and not until I'm sure that it's necessary. Elizabeth Price, would having a prosecutor enhance the application of justice or exacerbate a difficult situation? Uh, is Elizabeth here? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I do have Catherine. a sister named Catherine. Elizabeth. I Did can you? get her on the phone. Catherine. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it, could, it, it could go either way. Uh, I like the way Mayor Fober runs the court. I feel like he does look out for people's needs. Um, and he keeps them from taking certain steps unless they're absolutely ready. Um, it, it could make things more complicated to start acting like a bigger court, but yet it might be helpful. So I don't really know the uh, final answer to that. And, and the most dangerous words, if it's always been that way, I kind of like those words and it is dangerous, so. The, the next question is to all of you, and let's start with, uh, with Laura and move down the line. How qualified are you right now to implement and defend restorative justice? I think I'm really qualified because I worked for five and a half years as a prosecutor. I've also done criminal defense work and I understand what programs are. Usually they're called pretrial diversion programs. That's number, that's number one, where you try to, before somebody pleads guilty, you, you try to work with them. If you do this and you do this, we're going to dismiss the charge. Let's say a kid, a kid, and when I say kid, I mean that 18 to 25 year old group because we don't do juveniles in mayor's court, okay? So there's young, young adults who really need protected by mayor's court, by the way. Collateral consequences are awful these days. So that we can have community service and you, go, you did graffiti, go clean it up, come back to me, I'll dismiss the case. Um, you have, we're trying to be a dementia friendly community. I brought this up last night to the advisory group about that. Um, a lot of people with dementia tend to do shoplifting and because they put in their pocket and forget. And so if we can try to do something for that group of people that we don't, we don't charge them with a crime like theft. And so things like, there are just so many different types of diversion. I'm, I'm ready to go on that. <laughs> Catherine, how qualified are you right now to implement and defend restorative justice? I worked for many years in the healthcare field and my specialty was patient education and I always felt like if I could have people understand what was going on in their body, um, the mechanism and how a drug affected that, that they would be more compliant and they would be taking their medication as directed and perhaps they even needed less medication. I also extended that into alternative health to complement that. So I feel like working with people and in a very encouraging and positive way um, to get them to understand what they can do for themselves and the impact that things have on them. I think I've had that kind of experience and I, and I loved it. So I'm, I'm very much excited about that. Um, there are forms of restorative just, justice that I don't know some of the forms. There is a retreat. Uh, or a conference going on at the end of this month and there's some literature about it over the table if anyone is interested. Um, I would like to say that restorative justice is not just about what happens in the court because it's about what happens within the community and day to day how we treat each other that we are not, uh, we're not a religion, we're not a race, 
We're not a gender. Ultimately, we all belong when our roots are in the same thing. And there's a practice that we can all make every day, and I'm sure all of us do already. I think this is a great community. <laughs> Pam Canine, how qualified are you right now to implement and defend restorative justice? I've been teaching seventh and eighth graders for approximately 36 years. So call it by many names, but I, I believe I'm well equipped to start down the road for restorative justice in the courtroom. That said, restorative justice is not a trademark term. You don't see the little copyright after it. That's why I'm very careful in a public forum like this to use the term restorative justice techniques or restorative methods. I look forward to honing my skills to see how restorative justice as such can be used in the confines or certainly in the arena of the, the mayor's court because I believe that it can. So this is a question I'll be exploring at the conference at the end of the month. Gerald, how qualified are you right now to implement and defend restorative justice? I'm not qualified right now. I plan on attending the symposium at the end of the month. And the elections are November 7th, and that gives me the mayor will probably be sworn in sometime in uh, January. So that'll give me some time to take what I learn from that symposium and see how I can implement it. But I have talked with the mayor uh, over that a number of times. And he says, hey, I've been using restorative justice uh, ever since I've uh, been uh, the mayor. So I plan on sitting down with him. It seems like it's been successful. So I'll get his opinions kind of pick his brain and, and then move forward. But Joe, I, other than the term I've heard and a little bit of reading, I'm not ready to implement, uh, or I'm not qualified to implement right now. The next question is for everyone. You can answer it in the order you feel called. How important is Yellow Springs Mayor's Court to the village justice system? Pam? I believe it's extremely important. I believe it's one of the tools in our village justice tool belt, if you will. We have a wonderful village mediation program here. We have the growing interest in restorative justice, we have the mayor's court, so I think we're, I, I think we're very fortunate in that regard. I saw Catherine's hand next. How important is Yellow Springs mayor's court to the village justice system? I feel like the mayor's court is a, sets a trend for the justice and how people treat each other and themselves. So I believe that it represents something um, and along with the mediation and the police department and counseling, justice can happen. <laughs> Laura Carlos, how important is Yellow Springs Mayor's Court to the village justice system? In 2016, it was irrelevant. Because most of our cases weren't Xenia. In 2017, it's more relevant. However, and I think it can be so much better than it is now. And that's not a diss on David Fober. It's simply that there, first of all, we need to bring all the cases back. When I look in this pile of cases, you know, underage drinking, open container, you know, public indecency, which is really keen in the Glen, you know, I, do, I see a lot of things that got hit hard that we could do a lot, be kinder and gentler here. Gerald Sims, how important is Yellow Springs Mayor's Court to the village justice system? One that has had the experience of uh, having to go to Xenia, uh, the Mayor's Court is the community. 
is court. It, it's how we decided how we want justice to be served. We have decided that we want a mayor's court. It's for the citizens of our small community. Without the mayor's court, you'd be going to Zenia. Let's keep it here. And it's good. Uh, and good is fine for me. This is a question for all of you. What should the role of the mayor be in regards to community policing policies? Pam? Again, I'll go on record as saying I would follow, I believe the mayor should follow the recommendations of our village justice task force as approved by council. So the role of the mayor in regard to policing, I, I want to draw a line between, well, let, me, let me first remind you about the three levels of government, executive, legislative, judicial. So I will draw a line between what the mayor is doing in mayor's court, what the executives are doing through, through her job in this case, and what is going on with our, uh, what's the other one? the legislative, the judicial, the executive, the council. So I want to be very protective of that. So when it comes to the police and the policing issues, I believe it's very important to listen to our police chief and the, follow the good practices that are coming through Chief Carlson. But I also believe that the judicial branch is separate and must be regarded as such. What should the role of the mayor be in regards to community policing policies? Uh, simply, the role of the mayor is the judicial role, and the policing, the, the policing policy is set by the village council, by the state, but not by the mayor. The mayor is in the judicial and just with an unbiased mind decides what's happened. I heard you. <laughs> I think the mayor has a really important role. Um, I totally support what the Justice System Task Force has done. I've been on the Mayor's Court Subcommittee. I like, love the 365 Groups policing statement, which was adopted. Um, but the mayor is, is also a check. So if we see police officers who are bringing cases, uh, for example, if this community passed a policy from council, uh, we're not going to charge paraphernalia cases. Okay. Because a lot of people get picked up on those and a lot of people don't like those paraphernalia cases. If they bring one to me, I'm going to look at it and say, that's, we're, not, we're not enforcing that. You, know, that's, you brought it to me, but the, that's not the policy of the village. You know? or, if, or if I see there's some aggressive policing going on, you, usually that, that we're going to try to figure out how to mediate that some other way. And we're, we're not necessarily going to give somebody a conviction. If, and I've seen cases like that where we've had aggressive policing. And I think the mayor has a role, a, a teaching role to play, as well as a role to play in implementing what all of you want for an outcomes here. Gerald, what should the role of the mayor be in regards to community policing policies? Uh, the village has been working very hard on coming up with a community policing policy. And, and our police department has been, I think, since uh, March, April, when we finally picked a, uh, a new chief, they are moving forward with the desires of the community as they do their job. And I, as mayor, I, have, I feel the mayor should be separate from that uh, and judge the cases as they come forward, given our charter and, and what the uh, state of Ohio says we're allowed to do. We'll ask each of you to answer this question. Why do you consider yourself to be the best candidate for mayor of Yellow Springs? Start with Pam. If you read my, I, I do have a little card in the back of the room, it was the insert that was in the Yellow Springs News, and if you didn't see one, please take a look at it. I have deep and long roots in this community, but that alone won't do it. So does Jerry, so does Kathy. So 
I'm interested in taking my skills, taking my knowledge, taking my excitement and love for this village and using it in a way that I think will benefit the citizens, the, the, the faces of those of you I know out here just sitting right here and looking at you. I just, all I want to do is smile. But I, I will say this, that I will present a well-rounded, let's call it a platform, with my mayor's court emphasis, my emphasis on ceremony, and the emphasis on the educational component, where I really want to give back and create a more visible presence from our mayor and provide you with a very well-rounded package. Catherine, why do you consider yourself to be the best candidate for mayor? Um, I feel like I'm honored to be sitting here with some really amazing people. <laughs> this is a hard question. But I'll tell you, I am creative, I'm innovative, I, do th I like to do things in a new way, to experiment. I feel like I'm compassionate, I feel like I've been there. I feel like there's a lot of people I can relate to because of my life experience. Um, I've raised three children and that can give your, uh, uh, you a notch up on the ability to discern things and <laughs> to guide young people. Um, and I think I'm excited about it. I would love to do it. Laura Curlis, why do you consider yourself the best candidate for mayor? Yeah, Yellow Springs is my chosen home. It was my husband's before his death. Um, we plan to make this our, our home for the rest of our lives. I love this community and ever have ever since I was a small child um, coming here uh, with my family. Um, I have a wealth of experience in the legal realm as prosecutor and as criminal defense. I know how the game is played and it often is a game, you know, a lot of times. And I respect, not, I tell my, my son and other kid, young people, 99% of police officers are family people wanting to go home at night. However, as one judge told me, police reports are works of fiction. And that means you have to read them carefully because they're reporting what other people say and sometimes they're not saying they don't have the right perception. Very few, very, there are very few lies in them that you have to read between the lines and I've got a lot of experience with that. I worked for eight years for a mayor doing, I've done dozens of weddings because um, I, I was in there every day, ceremonial oaths and that sort of thing. Um, those are kind of give me things, although you, you can mess them up too and then there's some real problems. Um, yeah, uh, other thing is, I used to give those third grade talks to, to many school groups about the three branches of government. I'd be happy to do that if people feel the need for that. However, the mayor's court's going to be busy if we can bring these cases back from senior. Thank you. Gerald Sims, why do you consider yourself to be the best candidate for mayor? Uh, early in my life as, as, a, as a young, a real young fellow that was growing up, uh, I looked to my father for, for guidance and so forth. And one of the things that he taught me was, you listen, you listen, you listen. And listen. Then you take your time and then you make a decision. So my dad has taught me to listen, to be patient, and then be fair. Given that the community has elected me a number of times for public office, that says, at least I feel, that the community respects me and feel that I've gained the knowledge and the qualifications to do the job. And I plan on bringing what I've learned over the years serving on the school board, serving on council, the, the many number of volunteer organizations that I work for. I have somewhat dedicated my life to serve the community and being your mayor will give me just another opportunity to do that. Ladies and gentlemen, will you acknowledge the candidates for mayor?